Welcome to Psydactic, Residency Edition, your podcast resource to survive and thrive in your psych residency. I am your host, Dr. O'Leary, and as of recording this, I am a second-year resident in the National Capital Consortium Psychiatry Residency Program. However, make no mistake, I do not speak for this program, nor do I speak for the Department of Defense or the federal government or anyone else, for that matter. What I say is my opinion, and I reserve the right to be wrong. So trust me at your own risk. It's a risk some are willing to take. In addition, I often use colorful language, in some cases to try to capture the zeitgeist of the period in which I'm speaking, and in others to try to keep you, and myself, from falling asleep. Some of this language may seem insensitive, but it is not my intent to offend, dismiss, or belittle anyone. In today's episode, I'm going to necessarily oversimplify how a technology that had independently been innovated for anesthetizing pigs before slaughter made its way into psychiatric practice. I'm speaking of electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT for short. I love the dirty rotten details of history, so this episode is dedicated to the first pioneers who actually conceived of strapping patients to a bed and shocking their heads. These innovators were not the first were the last neuropsychiatrist to attempt to treat the mind by assaulting the body. Long before there was neuroscience, ancient physicians might apply electric stingrays to the head to relieve headaches or use electric eels to cast out demons. Fast forward centuries to the early 1920s, when the world was still postictal from the Great War and heading rapidly toward another global convulsion. At this time, before there was electroconvulsive therapy, also known as electroshock therapy, There was chemical convulsive therapy, and before there was this chemoconvulsive therapy, there were a number of other somatic therapies, including bizarre ones like the scotch douche therapy, where jets of hot and cold water were directed at patients, similar to other hydrotherapies that naturopaths might prescribe to rid the body of impurities or activate the healing powers of the autonomic nervous system. There were more sinister-sounding therapies like pyrotherapy, where high fevers were induced, often by causing malaria, after injecting patients with the plasmodium parasite. As odd as it sounds, pyrotherapy was found to be rather effective at treating a once common cause of psychosis, neurosyphilis. You may have heard of insulin coma therapy, where physicians induced a coma in patients by giving large doses of insulin and dropping their blood sugar to sometimes fatal levels. Interestingly, many of these patients also seized, which at the time was considered an unwanted side effect. There were also more benign-sounding therapies like prolonged sleep therapy, which, despite its cozy name, resulted in dozens of patient deaths after spending days to months chemically sedated in hopes that this artificial sleep would alleviate the anxieties that had taken control of their mind. Most previous somatic therapies have fallen out of medical practice and are either relics of history or relegated to vitalist approaches like naturopathy. However, convulsive therapies remain in the form of ECT. In the first convulsive therapies, chemicals were injected into patients to make them seize. Why would anyone ever attempt this, you might ask? And like so many other quirks of history, it it may have been in part due to an insidious rumor. Some early epidemiological studies had reported that patients with epilepsy tend to have less psychotic illness than those without. But, in fact, patients with epilepsy are more prone to psychotic illness. In 1934, Dr. Ladislas Joseph von Meduna from Hungary hypothesized that Inducing seizures into catatonic patients by injecting them intramuscularly with camphor oil would improve them, and it seemed to work. Maduna wasn't simply chasing an epidemiological rumor, though. He had extensively studied the dissected brains of patients with dementia precox, now labeled schizophrenia, as well as those with epilepsy, and had noticed that glial cells in the brains of the chronically psychotic were reduced while those in patients with epilepsy were relatively increased. Perhaps, Maduna hypothesized, 
Seizures caused a proliferation of glial cells, which are protective against psychosis. But chemically inducing seizures was not without its problems. Camphor was unpleasant to have injected, and, and also not very reliable at inducing seizures. Later, Maduna moved from camphor to IV pentolinetetrazole, uh, cardiazole or metrazole as branded. However, due to unfortunate side effects of metrazole's uh, sympathetic activation, patients were frequently terrified. They would have this chemically induced panic, which really did not encourage them to try again. The first ECT machine was developed near where the ancient god Jupiter sits in timeless glory, staring out at humanity with empty granite eyes. In Rome, by doctors Ugo Cerletti and Lucio Bini. If you think that sounds like the founders of a bourgeois pasta company, I think you'll find their noodles rather shocking. At a 1937 meeting in Switzerland, they first reported promising results electrifying dogs, a favored model of physiologists at the time, also very abundant. When first applying electrical shocks to their canine subjects, initially electrodes were placed in the mouth and in the anus. Half the animals died unceremoniously of cardiac dysrhythmias, which at first made the therapy seem unattractive for human testing. But other therapies, like insulin comas and deep sleep therapy, were also killing patients, so it wasn't a complete deal killer. Beanie, with an ample supply of stray dogs from the local dog catcher, later found that placing the electrodes on the bilateral temples reliably produced non-fatal seizures. This observation combined with another observation that the pigs at the local slaughterhouse uh, were shocked in a similar way to induce anesthesia before having their throats slit. And if their throats weren't slit, a few minutes later, they'd get up. So this gave Terletti and Beanie the confidence they needed to try this out on people. It was a stray human caught wandering and speaking unintelligibly at the local train station who became the first homo sapien test of ECT. He could not communicate who he was or where he lived, and he had developed a notable indifference to his surroundings in a state suggestive of catatonia. This first documented attempt at human ECT took three tries, each with increasing voltage. After the first two attempts, the patient woke quickly, to the relief of the physicians, who I assume were hoping they would not kill him, but also proved that he didn't have a seizure. After the third attempt, the patient became tonic and then entered a clonic phase of an epileptic seizure. The procedure had worked. After a total of 11 treatments, S.E., as he was called, was discharged home, having regained enough faculties to remember who he was and reportedly to begin working again, although he was far from cured. ECT rapidly spread across the globe, despite World War II. In fact, the migration of doctors fleeing from tyrannical regimes in Europe may have encouraged its spread. As the practice of ECT spread, the potential side effects from causing seizures could not be ignored, especially how sustained muscle contractions could tear flesh and break bones. The addition of paralytics and anesthesia brought that chapter to a close, and it appears ECT would continue to become safer and more tolerable for patients. While catatonic psychosis was the first condition treated by ECT, it was subsequently found to be the most effective in unipolar depression, and even in mania. Psychiatrists with a new toy were eager to try it out on any number of hard cases, including patients colloquially called psychopaths, bedwetters, and addicts. The initial excitement resulted in overly broad application of ECT, garnering the criticism of more deliberate psychiatrists as well as the public. ECT was featured in the hit film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in 1975, based on the 1962 novel by the same name, which had inspired a Broadway production in 1963 that later went off-Broadway. Now the image of ECT as a punishment for bad behavior is stuck 
indelibly into the consciousness of multiple generations. Even the current popular YouTube channel SciShow describes ECT as a dangerous treatment only used as a last resort. Around the same time that ECT was losing support despite gaining evidence of efficacy, other effective treatments for psychotic symptoms and depression were developed, including the first antipsychotic chlorpromazine, marketed as Thorazine, and the first tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine, an antihistaminic drug whose antidepressant properties were, like convulsive therapies, first discovered while attempting to treat psychosis. Lithium was found to treat mania, though relatively slowly, and provide effective maintenance therapy as well. Benzodiazepines were effective for a large percentage of catatonic patients, becoming the default first-line treatment. A slew of other drugs subsequently gave clinicians many choices to turn to if their first, second, or even third attempt at pharmacotherapy failed. And yet, ECT is still often referred to as the most effective, most powerful, most underutilized, and underavailable therapy in psychiatry today. Will ECT ever make it out of the shadows? Why do we even still practice it today? Is it just an elaborate placebo? Will other therapies like TMS edge ECT out of the market? These and more questions will be answered with varying levels of competency in future episodes of Sidactic Residency Edition. Mm-hmm.